Hey, I'm Jess Wood, and I'm on an episode of Small Talk with Lala Hart. Hey! <laughs> So the first time I think we met was on Pull Tony. Yes. And I saw you go up and perform. The world famous comedy store. Yes, at the world famous comedy store. <laughs> the whole Pull Tony gang has just become this little group. I know, it's like a nice community of people. I love everybody so much. Which is super supportive. But I've yeah. always loved your style and you seem like such you. an interesting, fascinating woman. And I just Thank had you. to have you on my show, especially once I found out that you're an original LA native. I am. <laughs> Hi. Los Angeles has you. <laughs> yeah. And you always say people, people still ask you where you're from. Yeah. And it's right on your... Like, oh, are you from LA? No, I'm Madison, Wisconsin. But thanks. Mm. I like it. It's good. Yeah. So you're from LA. Born and raised. Right near here. It's very strange to be here. But, and you lived in New York. I did bit. live in New York, yes. And how, when did you start comedy? Oh my god, a long time ago. I was on Deaf Comedy Jam uh, in 19, I'm going to say 19, that's already 18 <laughs> years ago, uh, 96. And then I quit comedy for a while, and then I uh, came back, and it was a, a tumultuous time. The comedy. And you've been back in the LA area for the last two years. Two years back home, yeah. That's, and you were in uh, New York for 15 years. For a long time, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I, I went to New York one time, my first year of comedy. I went out there mm. and uh, I just did a couple of the rooms. It's totally different style. What did you find different up. about it? Well, I just I feel like the comics out there are a lot like tougher in a yes. way. Because, yes. you know, in, in Los Angeles, it's up stand up. There's a lot of people who are doing improv or acting. And we talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, like the stand up comedians out there, like comedy. Yeah, that's it. Is what 100%. they're doing. Every day, every night. Six sets. You know, it's insane. People are insane. But it's tough there because. You know, there's elements. Like, we don't mm -hmm. have any weather here. Mm -hmm. You can go out every night here. You don't have any excuses. There's no snow. These kids will go out in the snow. They'll pack on the hats and the coats and shit and just go and still get up at Mike's and still go, you know, foot snow and sleet. No so, one will leave here if it rains. So you started comedy in New York. What got yeah. you into stand-up? Um, heroin. <laughs> 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 it's true. It's your story. Um... Mm -hmm. I was doing heroin in New York City, which, by the way, really outrageous in the in the '90s how much heroin there was. It was just everywhere. It was everywhere, and uh, I enjoyed it as as a kid. And um, I had lost everything at mm. one point uh, during my heroin use. And as you will, it's not really good for keeping friends or jobs or relationships going. And so uh, my boyfriend was in prison. I lost my apartment. I lost all my friends. And I needed a job. And I thought, what do I like? What do I like? And I love comedy. And mm -hmm. so I found a waitressing job at the comic strip in New York City. Okay. And it was amazing because the guys that were there and the women that were there were just, you know, Dave Attell and Patrice O'Neill and Caroline oh. Ray. I mean, it was just these huge heavy hitters, you know. And I was still using uh, heroin, and uh, one of the comedians there named Rick Shapiro, who's also a very wild man, uh, saw me, and we used to kind of just do voices to each other and stuff, and I've always done a lot of voices. Mm -hmm. um, I hung out with gang members when I was 14, 15, and I... Um, I used to smoke a lot of PCP with them, and <laughs> and when we smoked PCP, something funny would happen to me where I would, well, either I'd black out, because mm -hmm. it is elephant tranquilizer, I don't know if you guys know, um, <laughs> it's really heavy duty shit, um, but the thing that I would do most is voices, and mm -hmm. I'd usually just mimic the voices of the people that I was hanging out with, so I was always like, hey, what's up, Domi? You know, I always do like a Mexican cholo voice. And so um, I was doing that with Rick Shapiro at the comic strip. Even though I was kind of fucked up, I would mm -hmm. still like play with him a little bit in voices. And so he said, you're a comedian. And I was like, no, I'm a heroin addict. You know? He's like, no, you should come and do this show. So he was doing a one-man show, but he said he was casting all the voices in his head. Oh, wow. 
So I was cast as the voice of the women. He had a bunch of women that he was freaked out about. And so one of the things I had to do in the show was tell one joke. Mm -hmm. So I had to write a joke. And I told the joke. And the laughter that I got from the joke was such a better high than the heroin high. That it's like my Jesus moment. I'm like, the laughter saved me from heroin. Mm -hmm. And like, I can't imagine going back. Like since I've been doing, I can't imagine not doing comedy. And I can't imagine doing heroin. So you you got into comedy and comedy got you sober? Yes. Wow. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And Rick Shapiro, I hope I'm not like bringing him out of a room or something. The rooms, you know, he's a friend of Bill. And, uh, you know, he took me to the rooms and he helped me get clean. And he really, he really was a huge part of me finding my comedic voice and putting no, me on stage. No, absolutely. Like, I remember when I first got sober... Um, I would go to the rooms and it was just so nice to like be able to connect with a lot of people and you know it's crazy how much in the comedy scene people are able to use stand-up to get out of addiction yeah. you know and I just I'm so grateful that early on I was able to like see where my path was going and if I continued I mean I was really bad Adderall and cocaine addict you know but I wouldn't change anything now because I feel like it's helped me develop such great empathy towards other people who are still in the depths of their addiction, yeah. you know? And I feel like if I can just share my story or live my life, and that is a way that you can inspire people to, like, reach out for help. Because I think for a long time I, I didn't I didn't know I could get help like that, yeah. you know? Yeah, and it's also a hustle. I mean, right. it's funny to think about, like, I was a drug addict. I had to hustle drugs all the time, and now I'm a comedian. I got to hustle spots. You know what I mean? It's well, kind of like a hustle, hustle, a, hustle. It's such a better trade off. It is it? much better, much better. And it's not illegal, and you can't get in trouble. You know, you can't die. And so, I, mean, I mean, you can die on stage figuratively. There's something about being on stage, and like, I mean, the, the one thing I really liked about you the first time I saw you is like, you were just so real and raw, and like talking about these crazy stories when they were interviewing you. And for me, it's like, I love the rush I get when I tell a really, like, edgy joke that the audience does not think I'm going to say. It, like, makes them think, you know? And I feel like you can relate to me on that Oh, level. totally, totally. I mean, they, uh, on Kill Tony, they kind of attacked me for, you know, my age and for, even though we're all the same age. And, uh, but, you know, my girls are a lady, and so they always like to attack a lady about her age. Um... But they, somehow we started to talk about abortion. Mm -hmm. And I told them I'd had all these abortions. And I said, yeah, I've had five abortions. And Tony, the, the host said, my, oh my God, my mom has five kids. And of course, after the show, I was thinking, I should have just said to him, I made the right choice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh -huh. I mean, I think, I think I was, uh, I think I did the right thing. I would have a whole variety show with me to, today. I wouldn't be able to be here, you know, alone and showcasing a <laughs> child next to me. <laughs> no, I, I, I remember that moment, actually. I just, like, love how honest and, and raw you were. And it's, like, Thank immediately you. when I saw that, it was, like, she is very interesting. I got to have her on Small Thank Talk. You. you. know, it's called Small Talk, but we definitely get pretty deep here. I know. You know? I and I, um, what advice would you give anybody who is, like, struggling with an addiction? Um, to, f well, first to ask for a little help from someone that you trust. You don't necessarily have to get into a room right away, like to a 12 step, but to even just confide in a friend that you trust and then be gentle with yourself and try to get into a room and try to hear the steps mm -hmm. and hear those stories from other people. Because like you said earlier, it's very hard to know that you're not alone and to ask for help and that help is actually, and that's another thing in comedy that ties in is like, we need to ask each other for help. We need to sometimes work on some stuff together. The thing about Kill Tony that I really love is that they're roasting us, mm -hmm. but I'm getting material from Absolutely. them, right? I use And it's like, that. I say worse things about myself, oh, yeah. so it's like, I feel like pretty strong that I can take it, and yeah. you know, for the for the most part, it's like, all I care is, as long as my one minute slays, oh, and that's yeah. all that matters to me. But, it, but going back to the addiction thing, finding, a, finding an outlet, no matter what it is, whether it's art or music or numbers, whatever you love, to just kind of pour yourself into that. And that 
you'll probably meet more people that do that kind of stuff. And that was part of, for me, the comedy, why it was such a great thing to get away from the drugs is because the drugs, there was a drug community, Mm -hmm. but there's a comedy community, you know, and we are a part of it. And that's why we met and how we're, you know, how we're friends. Uh, Do you ever talk about any of the crazy drug times you've had on stage? Yes. And turn them into jokes? Yes. The PCP stuff a lot. Uh, heroin, yes. I taught, yeah, how could I not? Right. I mean, Jesus, it was a time, yeah. Um, yeah, because I hung out with cholos, so we smoked a lot of PCP, and, uh, you know, they always called me a lightweight, and I was like, you guys, it's for elephants. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it takes <laughs> down an elephant. Like, let's not <laughs> get into this. Um, and you moved out here two years ago. Well, how would you say the comedy scene in L.A. is different from when you were making rounds in New York? It's like when you were there, same thing. Like, they're really tough. They're very um, focused and, you know, weed is not legal. <laughs> and, uh, and I love weed, but, but man, does it make a difference when it's sunny every day, everybody smokes pot all the time, and then people are getting up on stage. It's... I don't think it makes for a great set uh, myself for me personally. I feel mm-hmm. like it dulls my edge a little bit. If I never really, I never smoke before I go on stage mm-hmm. because I feel like it, it just dulls me a little. Do you bit. like having that, that that full clarity? Oh yeah. It's when you're on stage and it's almost like when you get that applause, that laugh, you can fully absorb. Yeah. Absorb it because it's a it's a different high. Oh yeah. Right. It's a totally different high, and I just. I love it when I'm on stage and a joke hits and I know I get people to think. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, oh that's really, yeah. I feel like that's when I feel the most, like, powerful in stand-up. And, it's, and, and I'm constantly learning and growing and, you know, just trying to be in the moment mm-hmm. more with it. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, it's hard to not lean on your material all the time. And what I'm discovering now being kind of like a veteran, I guess, of comedy is that if you do really ground yourself in the moment a lot of times on stage and you know you have all these jokes in you, that you can be more playful, that you can just enjoy yourself a little bit more. Like the Kill Tony thing is so interesting to me because it's all improvised, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just up there just flying by the fucking seat of our pants. We don't know what they're going to ask. We don't know what we're going to do. And so for me, the first, and well, every time I get up there, I really try to think, what joke do I have to match what they are asking me? Do you know what I mean? Like, if they have they they asked me about uh, if I had done anything big, and I said Def Jam, and then I worked in my Def Jam joke. Mm-hmm. So it was like, and they go, "Oh, that's a great joke. You should do that on stage." I do, fucker. This is an interview. This is what people do. We're comedians. We want to work in our material. I watch late night shows. I know what's supposed to happen here. You know what I mean? So I feel like letting allowing yourself to do that. And for me, the weed makes me a little bit more self-conscious mm. where well, I wouldn't it, be. Yeah, I, you're thinking a lot yeah. and it can get really like, in internal in your head. Yeah. In your head. Yeah. So you think a lot but I feel like you get at the right level which is, I don't know, I, I can do both. Yeah. Sometimes it depends. Good for you. Well, girl, as long as I'm not doing the Adderall cocaine, I think I'm good. Yeah, don't do that, kids. <laughs> or heroin or PCP. Thank you. Not How do you feel like comedy has changed over the years? Oh my gosh, it's so different. Um, Well, when I started, like when I did Deaf Comedy Jam, I hadn't even been doing comedy a year. Mm -hmm. And I showed up, yeah, I, I... I was in New York City, I'd quit the heroin, I did the Rick Shapiro show, I was like, what's next? I don't know, but I really like this comedy thing. I found a contest at the New York Comedy Club, <clears throat> excuse me, it was called the Best Amateur African American Comedy Contest. Uh-huh. And I was like, hey, I don't see any other contests, let me go to this <laughs> contest, and if they don't want me, they can tell me to go, you know, that's cool, I'll, I have an open mind. And you pay $10 to get in, and you could win $50. And remember, at this point, I needed $50 yeah. <laughs> really bad, right? So um, I go. It's an all-black show. Um, it, the, the audience is black. The comics are black. I'm the only girl on the show. I'm the only white person in the entire place. And the way that it works is very much like Apollo, where the audience chooses who wins. Okay. So it's by applause, right? So... 
I fucking slaughter. And it, this is literally like my third time maybe going on stage. And people are dying. And I think it had a lot to do with, I mean, yes, I know the stories. I'm telling all stories from here, from me. Uh, the black girls that I hung out with, the, the Mexican girls I hung out with. You know, I'm doing a lot of girl stuff, race stuff, things about that. And people are dying. And they're like, how does she fucking know this, this white girl? And... I felt like maybe a little bit of my success in those rooms was because of my being so different than right. everyone else. Like it was almost like there's a ventriloquist at the rock concert, you know, all of a sudden everyone's like, whoa, this is interesting. Um, so you feel like you had everybody's attention. Yeah. And they were really like at first everyone's like, oh, no, no. You know, a lot yeah. of crossed arms, a lot of like, I, no, we don't want this. Thank you very much. We're not buying what you're selling. And then I would just, I came out, my bit as a, as a new comedian, I came out uh, as the character of a black man, where I came out and I was like, what's up, what's up, what's up? Like, I was like a crazy, like one of the guys that I hung out with, I was like, I'm just gonna do him and fucking go crazy on this audience and they're not gonna know what the fuck to do about me and they're just gonna look at me like, what is this girl doing? And I'm talking to people in the audience and I'm yelling shit at people and, I, and everyone was like, what the fuck? And then I go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. That was crazy, right? That was like so weird. I'm sorry, you guys. I just wanted to like relate to everybody. And I go into this totally white girl character right after the black guy. And so everyone's so thrown because I'm not talking as myself. I'm just like, what's up? And then I'm like, hey, sorry. And everyone's like, what in the hell is happening? And that's just kind of what my my whole bit was was mm -hmm. like character into character into character and very act out very alive very all over the stage talking to people yelling uh, musical you know rap lyrics I'd scream at people you know do you like it raw because I like it raw you know like crazy mm -hmm. out of my mind do you think good. Um, it was good back then like when you first started yeah. were all female comedians like as as dirty as as you black so female like, comedians mm -hmm. only Mm -hmm. So I was I was destined to only do black rooms. I won, by the way, I won the contest. Oh, Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. I won the contest. I won four times in a row. Like I kept showing up and being like, "What's up now?" And everyone was like, "Oh no, the white girl's here again." Like she don't fucking win again. But then I started to get like other comedians saw me and they would bring me to their rooms. And I was going to the Bronx and I was going to Brooklyn and I was going to all these places. And like I say, I hadn't even done comedy a year. And the Def Jam people saw me. Mm -hmm. So they were like, whoa, okay, we want you. And I was like, okay. And then they brought me to Los Angeles, and that's where they shot the Def Comedy Jam. But it was it was a mess. It was a mess. They didn't okay. know what to do with me. I mean, I was so very... So what weird. happened after you shot Def uh, Comedy Jam? After Def Jam, it was a sad thing for me because, you know... I had so much fun there. Like it was yeah. like a dream. I mean, I'm I'm there. Cedric the Entertainer was my host. Wow. Oh my God. He brings me out to the audience. He's like, "What's up, y'all? All right, you know, uh, for your next comedian, want y'all just to keep an open mind, okay? Keep an open mind." That's exactly what he said to the crowd before I came out. And uh, <laughs> I'm like, what's up? You know, and I did that fucking character, and it was like everyone was like, "What? No, 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 no." So, so it didn't work? No, no, no. Why do you think it didn't work there? Well, we were in Beverly Hills where they shot the Def Jam. And uh, I had trained, if you will, in like Brooklyn, the Bronx, Long Island. Like I was playing like 2 a.m. at a YMCA. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so this was very bougie and very different and a lot of celebs. And then when we were done, the Def Jam people wanted me to wear like FUBU and braid my hair and stuff and I was like I'm not I can't be that's fakery mm -hmm. you know that's no good because I'm weird I'm like a mashup of weird stuff you know and you want to like be yourself yeah. you know you want to be yourself yeah. and you didn't want to like just be the brand that they wanted yeah. you to be mm -mm. So after Def Jam, did you take I quit a, I was you yeah I quit yeah like I was so I was heartbroken I was Harper, and I was a kid. I was twenty years old. I was a kid. You know oh what I mean? Goodness. I was a kid. So it's like I can't. What got you back into comedy? Um, How did you find? And, and you stayed sober after you quit too? Yeah, 
Yeah, I still stayed sober because I was with a now I was with a different type of people. Like I had met some people in Rick Shapiro's show that were kind of interesting downtown arty theater types that like Lower East Side, New York City theater, very alternative. Like people taking their boob out, people painting with their menstrual blood. Like it was insane. Yeah. Oh like my seriously, gosh. I watched her go pull an onion out of her coochie, like an onion, not a chive, like a bulbous fucking onion. Like uh, it was like a uh, sideshow, freak show, crazy pants but I loved it so when I quit doing stand up I just stayed in the Lower East Side and I did all these really strange plays and I was in sketch shows where you know there were dominatrixes in charge and it was very wild it was really wild I had a great time I had a great time but I missed stand up a lot yeah what brought you back um I don't know I missed it I think I just had like a breakup or something and I was like god I can't I'm not going to go do a play about a breakup. <laughs> like, I have to do a joke about a breakup. Mm-hmm. And so I went and I found some mics and I found some people that I had, you know, like-minded with. And I and I started doing it again. I missed it. I can't stop. You can't Isn't stop. It, I, it's so crazy how, like, you started and then you stopped, but then you collected all these different experiences and memories. And it's like, you know, Eric always talks to me about that you know, the timing of things, you gotta just trust in your timing because sometimes like that experience is necessary. Oh, and it's yeah. like the jokes that you're able to write are because of the experiences that you had to go through to get to this point and now you're here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're on small talk. Hey. Yeah. That's great. That's deep. And and it was different comedy back then. I mean, back then it was, you know, black people do this, white people do that. Um Everything was very like, uh, you know, like I said, there were black rooms that I did. That was it. It was just, you know, um, it was very, seg- it felt very segregated in a funny, weird way. And then when I was dabbling in the Lower East Side after Def Jam, it was like, it, it seemed to be changing. So there were all these other comedians that were showing up that were like, they were alternative to stand up but they so they were telling more stories on mm-hmm. stage and they were um and they were some black kids that were coming in that weren't the Def Jam style stand up and they really had wonderful voices people like you know Donald Glover and Baratunde Thurston and like you know really great or Eric Andre and I mean I, I came up with Eric Andre and Baron Vaughn like these and and now we see people um Michelle Buteau just got her Netflix 15 minutes like there it's great to see people rising to the top that were they had a very hard time coming in because the Def Jam guys were so intense about their way of comedy like Mm -hmm. this is how you do black comedy you know and then these kids came in and were like hey man if it makes people laugh it's comedy and it broke this whole weird thing open where like all of a sudden you didn't have to go to the clubs all of a sudden a bunch of comedians were getting onto Comedy Central and, and doing stand-up that never went into a club once. They were just doing bar shows or down in the Lower East Side in these funky theaters. So it was really changing a lot while I was in it. So I've seen a lot of changes come. Um, it was also much uh, less PC. People weren't as worried about, mm-hmm. you know, you can't say that, you can't say this. Like, I have had experiences where I've been called up by you know, NPR and the moth stories and they've asked me to if I could do a story and then when I tell them the story I want to do because it happens to have Mexican characters in it that I do their voices, yeah. they, don't they don't want that. Want that. And so I won't do it. And I, I said, I'm sorry, I won't, I won't, I'm not going to come and not do my authentic yeah. story. I think that's important is to stay true to yourself, yes. you know, and, and you no, know, I like to try to be as edgy as I can with my jokes too. Like, um, and I, I say things that maybe not everybody's going to agree with, but it makes you think. And I think, uh, what de- most definitely, my jokes don't ever come from a place of evil. You know, no, like it, no. everything comes from like a place of love and a yeah. place of like trying to educate people and get people to to like really think on a deeper level. You know, so I think that it's really dangerous when we try to stop people from saying certain things, oh, you know, it's and, and, or say you can't say certain words. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, it's all these words are attached to emotions, you know, where that's like how we're trying to like have people in control. Yeah. Like I'm not a hateful person, so I don't have the hate that drives a lot of 
the stuff that's going on in the world, right? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't relate to it. Um, but unfortunately, because I've had such a different experience for a white person, mm-hmm. the stuff that I tend to talk about. Because where did you grow up? I grew up in Los Angeles mm-hmm. proper, but between Venice and Santa Monica and Hollywood. And it happened to be that my parents were poor. I was on welfare. They never were married. They never lived together. I was on the bus a lot. I was in gangs. You know, it was very different life mm-hmm. growing up for me. Mm-hmm. So my experience is quite different. For like a white chick, so if you just look at me and you go, "What's this girl with the big it's earrings doing?" Perfect recipe you know? for a comedian, though. Well, that's what you think. <laughs> yeah, that's mm-hmm. what you think. But unfortunately, I've really been told a lot of the time that I'm not doing it right. You know that that's not. You can't talk about that. I've heard you can't talk about that so many times since I've been doing comedy. I mean, I with the Def Jam stuff, they were like, "You can't do those characters. You can't be a." you know, a Mexican girl or a Puerto Rican girl or a black girl, you can't do that. You're a white girl. And I'm like, yeah, but these are my experiences and, and the people who... And I think it's important, but I think it's so important that you continue to stick to yourself, you know? Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's like... It, people will, will tell you, like, this is the path, make it and stand up or this and that, but I think at the end of the day, the, like, the, the primary thing that keeps all success is, like, staying true to yourself because there is no story like yours. Right. You know, and, and you get to be in charge of telling your story in the way that you like to. Yeah. And the, and the way that's going to, you know, be able to impact the most people. So having started comedy, stopping comedy and um, starting comedy again... Do you think that you'll ever stop? No. I can't, no. No, you can't. I can't. I can't, can't stop. I'm so deep in it now. I'm so deep in it. And, I, and I, I'm finding those things, like you said, I'm finding the ways to, to make um, points and to make my voice heard and to make you know, my story digestible to people and not just come out like uh, when I started and I tried to tell my story like my real story like raised by hippies welfare vegan like you shouldn't be a vegan on welfare come on really (laughs) seriously i mean let's they're giving away the meat and cheese anyway so you know there was there was a lot of stuff that was very upsetting for me as a kid and Mm -hmm. when i tried to talk about it on stage the at first it was almost like I was so nervous and defensive when I yeah. was up there that I was just like, like a machine gun almost like, gah, 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 like to everyone in the audience, like, this is what I did, PCP, gangs, you know, and it was like, ah, and everyone, no one knew, you know, hey, we can't, we, you're very scary, we don't understand how you're, don't do it like that. Yeah. So I was always told like, this isn't right, you're not right. So the white audiences didn't love me. Then when I got back into it and I went into the white uh, rooms, and I started to do a lot of sex stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna do sex material. I love sex. I'm talking about <laughs> sex, how much I love it. I love having my period. I'm talking about my period. I hate those pills. They make your period go away. What the fuck are those? They're poisoning us. You know, so I was on a rampage. Like, I was like, ah, like I was just sex, 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 and m- masturbation. I love it. I call my clip the dolphin, you know. <laughs> like, I'm just fucking psyched, you know? I'm so, I'm so excited to be out there just sexing it up and on stage and woo. And I was at this club in New York at the time. Um, at the the ha ha ha, uh, I forget is it the ha or the ha ha uh, ha comedy club. So ha comedy club was a new club when I when I came back into stand up and it was like, oh, you want to work here? You can go three three shows a night. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And it was in Times Square, so it was like you got to go on and just power through three crowded crowded shows of tourists. So it was the best training to get back into it. And I was doing all the sex material, sex material. And I used to have the wait staff would stop working just to watch. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And then I had women who were thanking me afterwards. Mm-hmm. And that was my biggest uh, felt like accomplishment. Because I was like, oh my God, I'm making women feel like, oh, thank you for talking about that. Oh, God. Oh. Right? So I'm not and embarrassed. It's like, and it's and, like it, you normalize stuff, yeah. right? And it's like, we're saying things that people like think about, but they're afraid to say. And then you say it, and then it's like you release the tension yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so nice. And I'm not the victim. And this is what happened. This is what became actually a problem, which is so sad to say. But it really is um, very deep in our society. I was told when the owner, the owner was gone when I was hired for Ha. And when he came back into town, I had been written up a couple times, like in articles. I was getting like great spots. People were, like I said, people were loving it. They were thanking me. He came back and he started to watch my set. And he pulled me aside and he said to me, you know what, Jessica? 
I gotta tell you something. Eh, what you doing out there? It's good, you know, people are laughing. But you know what? You should talk about like how you don't like your body, how like it's hard to date. You know, we don't wanna hear you out there like, oh, I like to fuck. It doesn't, it's not good for, you know. And I was like, it's not good for what? And he goes, it's just, it's vulgar. It's vulgar. And I was, and I said to him, do you know who I follow? You know who I follow almost nightly is the comic who talks about coming in his girlfriend's eye and that she wears a patch. So now he fucks a pirate. I don't have anything like that. Anything. And I'm getting kicked out of this club. Wow. And so they, they were like, you gotta go. So I realized then what had happened was like maybe, you know, and I, I came up with Schumer and, all, you know, because everyone's like, Amy Schumer, very sexual. Why did you, how could you not be Amy Schumer? She's very sexy. I go, yes, victim. When a woman is a victim of mm-hmm. sex, oh, bring it, gosh, hey, wow, this girl's good. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's good. Look at how she's, look at how she's scared. Look at how she's nervous. Look at how she's, she doesn't like her body and she's making fun of her vagina. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. no, I'm sorry. I don't like that. Mm-hmm. I don't like the shame that's right. attached to the sex and the, oh my God, this is so scary. Just like sex, right girls? No, mm-hmm. no, and no again. And I'm not like a preachy prude lady. I love sex, like I just said, but I like to feel good. I want to yes. be the like a winner in it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be the victim. I think that's the way you can like empower other people. Right. Feel the same way. Like that's why you know what my my catchphrase joke. Yeah. I can suck a dick standing up. Yes. And I say that in my joke, that's and right. everybody like cheers. Yes. Because it's just so shocking that I would say that. Yeah, right? but, it's but it's funny perfect. and it's perfect, and it's just like taking ownership of yourself. Exactly. But I love that. I love exactly. what everything you just said. Well, thank so you. Great. Thank you. You can relate on a lot of well, things. Well, let's not nice. be victims. I mean, right. please, you know. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. It, it's a, it's about time we will stop being a victim in yeah. many areas of their life. Yeah. And I think when you stop being a victim and you start being a victor and you take ownership of things, it's uh-huh. like. No one can say anything to hurt me anymore. And why can't I celebrate what makes me feel good? That's right. That's it. That's all there is. I mean, what else is there? And who doesn't love a good orgasm? Oh, my God. Hello. The best. (laughs) By yourself or someone else, it's all good. Together, (laughs) even better. Oh, my God. (laughs) It's like the best. (laughs) <laughs> oh, so good. Yeah. Jess, this has been so great. Really fun. This has been really great. Where really can everybody fun. find you? Okay. So I have a podcast. Yes. And you have a book. I have a book coming Okay, you got to talk about those too. Oh, God. Uh, hardest thing I ever did. Because I am a 10th grade dropout. So to write, I was like, Jesus Christ, I got to write you my really shit wrote, down. You wrote your own book. I wrote my own book. All of it. All of it. All by myself. It took me years. Years and years. Okay, and we need to talk about this. <laughs> You know, because pe- people always say, like, oh, I want to write a book, or you should write a book, I want to write a book, and this, that. But the amount of work it actually takes to sit Ugh. and write it, Ugh. and you did it. Yeah. Mm. What's the name and of your book? It's called Smile Now, Cry Later. Oh, I like that. Because, you know, I got through this life with my humor, mm-hmm. and I had a very hard life. But I've been making jokes since I'm, you know, single digits. I'm just like, let's get through this. Yeah. And your podcast. And my podcast is called Get Wood. Oh, yeah. Right. I like that. That's great. It's my last name, and I like to get it. When, when is your book coming out? I don't know. We're in the editing process right now. And is it like a, just a biography? It's a memoir. So okay. she, my agent, uh, had me continually add chapters. Because since I've moved back to Los Angeles, as I was telling Miss, Miss Hart... Um, I've lost like a, the love of my life. I lost my mom. So she kept saying like, "Can you you're writing it all down, right? Can you add that? And you make that a chapter?" And I was like, "Fuck, man, this is heavy." So yeah, so I added. So it's all in there. It's how all how in did there. you get? How long have you wanted to write the book? And then from the I didn't you, want to. You didn't. No, want to. I did. It was not my idea. No, I was doing a documentary about sex. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm very very curious about sex and sexuality in the United States of America, mm-hmm. and people ask me about the Me Too thing, and I say that it goes back to this: we do not have a set curriculum for sex education in any part of the U.S. Mm-hmm. There's no one set curriculum like there is for math, science, you know, stuff like that. So in any city, in any town, 
they can teach whatever they want mm -hmm. to their children about sex. And I find it's such a disservice mm -hmm. because of, there are a lot of places that are very religious and they don't want it and they do abstinence training and mm -hmm. that never works. People become pregnant with STDs and all that stuff. So because there's no education about it, because all we're sold is sex all the time since we're kids, all we see is sex all the time, and especially as women, we're supposed to be sexy, but not too sexy. And blah, blah. It's yeah. such a, a shit show, you know, um, that uh, I, I, um, I just don't think that, you know, I, I think that sex, so I was so curious as to what was happening out there and how people were getting educated that I went out with my little shitty camera and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna interview every girl I know and lady about what was your sex education? Did you get the sex talk? That was the question. Did you get the sex talk? And if you didn't, how did you learn about it? Mm -hmm. It was the most interesting documentary. I, I had so much fun. I interviewed about 60 women, ages 18 to 65. Wow. All ethnicities, all from all walks of life. Anyone I knew that I had made friends with, like my coffee chicks. I was like, do you guys mind? And these Puerto Rican, they're like, I guess it was called the pololo, the popopo. You know, like it was so cute. Like I was dying from everybody's story. But most people do not get educated about it at all, at all. They're most of the time, it, it's your middle. Wash your middle. Don't touch your middle, but wash your middle. You know, don't touch your peepee, -pee, but wash your peepee. -pee. It's all this weird stuff. We're not told the correct names. It's just so much. And then we're out in the everything, you know? Yeah. So I was going around and I was interviewing people. And a, a girl that I worked with told me that her mom was really interested in being interviewed by me because she heard that I was interviewing people. I was like, I'd love to interview your mom. So I went and met with her mom. And her mom was in publishing. And she, when I turned the camera off, her mom said to me, so what's your story then? You've been asking everyone else their stories. And I said, oh, God, I was raised by, you know, naked hippies. And they were fucking in front of me. And I had no idea what was going on. Um, and she goes... And, and like, I just kept talking and she goes, you need to write a book. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't, I'm a 10th grade dropout. And she goes, no, you need to write a book. And so she kind of talked to me and she kept following up with me, which, you know, was scary. Um, but she said a chapter a week, just a chapter a week. That's it. Just and how did you just add a chapter? It was it's random. Come to you. Yeah. And now it's finished. Yay. Mm -hmm. It's like 300 pages. I mean, we got to edit it down. Smile now, cry later. Smile now, cry later. But listen to Get Wood. If you enjoyed me here, you'll enjoy me uh, every couple weeks for an hour. Hey. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then the final thing is yes. just a message you like to give your future self in five years. Oh my God, Jess, I'm so proud of you. Look at all the love you allowed in and all the beautiful people you have around you. You totally deserve this. Success, baby. Mwah. I love you. Oh, Thank sweet. you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, my sweet friend. Oh, this is great. So good. <laughs> Small talk. Yay.